pledge allegiance to the flag of Jesus. Uh huh. We only pledge allegiance to the flag of Jesus. Uh huh. We only pledge allegiance to the flag of Jesus. Uh huh. We only pledge allegiance to the flag of Jesus. Uh huh. We only pledge allegiance to the flag of Jesus. Uh huh. We only pledge allegiance to the flag of Jesus. Uh huh. We only pledge allegiance to the flag of Jesus. Uh huh. This is called True Allegiance. What do you call a city without walls? The same thing you call the oppressed without justice, defenseless, unreliable, unsustainable, and unrepentant, a fabric torn out of frustration while the sky is painted with the tears of a disappointed father. The ground cries out for the loss of a brother while the wind whistles for the voiceless sister to kill a mockingbird. Better yet, a mocking jay. Our communities are set up like the Hunger Games. The fight to stay alive and the battle to survive has many attacking each other. While the wealthy barely privy to the plight of the wounded, we built castles so high that we can barely view the lowly. We aren't affected by others' tragedies until it touches our proximity. No time for mentoring. We're too busy, but so are the mentors. They're busy, and yet they make time. And they say you make time for what you love. Well, it's no wonder why the world looks the way that it does. We only have time for ourselves. That's what we love. The cardio magaly of our hedonism. In other words, we're full of ourselves. Time begs for our neighbor, yet time runs away so fast and we look up at a world divested from discipleship and wonder how it got so bad, so fast. A little leaven leaveth the whole lump but in politics we place our trust i thought it was in god we pledged allegiance to ourselves and made the opposing party our enemy why is society so far from god why do we seek a hypocrite's victory on a campaign of lies we make the president our savior yet our souls cry begging for true allegiance to rise allegiance to the king allegiance to the king may his kingdom come allegiance to his word let his will be done on earth as it is in heaven free from the abuse of power no deceit but true allegiance to jesus the triumphant king our allegiance must be pledged in his unshakable kingdom one faith one god indivisible with liberty eternally for all. Jesus, Father, we your people come to you as vessels are in desperate need of you. Arrest us in your presence, Father. May distractions be minimized, I pray. May our minds be singularly focused on what you want to say today to us. Thank you for inviting us into your presence. May our awareness, Father, be right where it needs to be to hear what you want to say. So as I lay my hands upon my brother, your vessel, to communicate your heart to us today, may we be like receptacles. We want to catch every drop. That we may be filled with you, and that we may be sent out into the earth for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Can we give it up for preach one time? Is that okay? 
so we're blessed to have a multitude of gifts in our community. Blessed to have bold, courageous preach. Amen. I'm going to do something uh, unique, I think. Um, I thought I made the term up until I looked it up last night. I found out it's totally a thing. A little sad, a little bit. But it's called a, a verbal montage. So what I need you to do is I need you to listen. I need you to take this in. Uh, goes. Greg, you gotta, you're going to put me. I'm a, we can't worship right now. You got I know. You got one that's worship. We're going to get back to it, though. Amen. We love Greg. Greg is awesome. <clears throat> Here it is. It's been over 12 hours. And we still in this stupid field. Usually during the growing season, working in this vineyard is about an eight hour shift. But during harvesting season, we've spent over 12 hours a day picking grapes. To add to it, my dad is skipping around like we ain't been out here for over 12 hours. He keeps going on and on about how every grape is a blessing and provision from the God of Israel. Fast forward. It's been over 12 hours and this man is still out here with me in this field. By now, my dad is so old, I'm doing all the work. He moves so slow, his hands so stiff, he can barely pick, he can barely pull, and yet, he still has that smile on his face. You got to love him. Fast forward. It's been over 12 hours, and she's still in labor. Is it supposed to take that long? Normally, when I feel anxious like this, my dad would tell me some story, some epic old story about how the God of Israel came and saved everything just when we were about to lose everything. Can't hear that, though, because my dad passed about six months ago. Even though he's gone, I can still hear him saying, trust the God of Israel. Fast forward again. It's been over, how many hours? You with me, amen. It's been over 12 hours. And the doctors have done all they can do. They haven't said anything, anything to me, but I can tell by the looks on their faces, whatever has got me will get me. Only thing I can think about with my time left is to tell my son Everything I can remember about my father and how my father talked all the time about the God of Israel. I hope and pray when I'm gone, he won't forget us and he won't forget God. Now that young boy grew up to take over that vineyard. That young boy's name was Naboth. We're going to read about him right now in 1 Kings chapter 21. And this is what the Bible says about Naboth. It says, some time passed after these events. Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard and it was in Jezreel, next to the palace of the king Ahab of Samaria. So Ahab, the king, spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard. So I can have it for a vegetable garden since it is right next to my palace. I will give you a better vineyard in its place. Or if you prefer, I will give you its value in silver. But Naboth said to Ahab, as the Lord is my witness, I will never give my ancestors inheritance to you. So Ahab went to his palace resentful and angry because of what Naboth, the Jezreelite, had told him. 
He had said, I will not give you my ancestors' inheritance. The fact that that's repeated means we should pay attention to that. It says, he lay down on his bed. This is Ahab. He lay down on his bed and he turned his face away and he didn't eat any food. Then his wife Jezebel came to him and said to him, why are you so upset that you refuse to eat? Ahab said, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite, he replied. I told him, give me your vineyard for silver, or if you wish, I will give you a vineyard in its place. But he said, I won't give you my vineyard. Now, the great part about a setup like that, half of y'all have no idea what I'm about to say next. And if you like communicating as much as me, you know I got y'all right where y'all I want y'all. This is perfect. Because you're like, we, I, we've been talking about the kingdom. We've been doing all of this work about kingdom identity. Find up there talking about farmers and vineyards. Make it make sense, Sonny. Why do y'all keep giving this man the mic? <laughs> Believe it or not, we're still talking about kingdom. The purpose of all of this is for us to understand a few things. One, you need to understand that when we talk about the kingdom, we are not just talking about an ethereal place that you can't see. We're talking about, if I could, if you would allow me to use a bit of slang, is that cool? Now, I know it's Detroit Church, and some of y'all did not sign up for that this morning, uh, but you're going to get it anyway, all right? Uh, when we talk about the kingdom, this is, what we, this is what this means. It's how God moves. It's how he does what he does. It's how he reigns, how he rules. Every kingdom has a few things. And we're going to go over them. We're going to analyze both the world's kingdom and the heavenly kingdom. Every kingdom has a few things. I'll tell you right now. Up front, three things. First is every kingdom has ideals. Every kingdom has a pattern of values. Every kingdom has principles that are deeply held by those under the rule of the king. You with me? Number two, every kingdom has an installation. All right? You ever heard the term the Patriot Way? Not everybody, I know. Uh, but for those who know New England Patriots, right, they have what's called a Patriot Way. They have a way that they install their values that led them to get, what, eight, nine Super Bowls or something like that in 20 years or seven. The point is, there is an installation method. Every kingdom, if it doesn't have a way to install its values, then it will lose and the people in the kingdom won't know what to subscribe to. Right? So every kingdom has ideals. Two, every kingdom has an installation, a how. And thirdly, every kingdom has an impact. There has to be a result from the kingdom. You with me? Now it's fun. Every kingdom, again, has ideals, installation, and impact. So to know the beauty of God's kingdom, of the heavenly kingdom, we would have to see the kingdom of this world at operation. And Ahab gives us an up-close look at the kingdom of this world. I told a little story about Naboth and his family, and I'll be honest with you, I took a little bit of creative license because the truth is we have no idea about Naboth's family from the scriptures. We don't know if the family, if that vineyard was in the family for three generations, five generations, ten, we have no idea. I had a little fun, I gave him three. Maybe there's more. But the point is we see King Ahab walk into this man's vineyard. I want to say we got a picture. You know, we put a lot of work in this picture. Where, where, my, where my vineyard picture at? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, there it is. You don't know, but <laughs> a toil. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. So, so Ahab walks into neighbor's vineyard and he says this, and this shows you the ideals of the kingdom of this world. He walks into his vineyard and says this, hey, uh, Naboth, I see you got your little vineyard going here. I dig it. Check this out. I like this. I want this. I need to turn this into a vegetable garden. Let me walk you through this real fun, because this is, this is interesting to me. Naboth wants a vineyard, but not for wine. He wants the vineyard to turn it into a vegetable garden, but not for food. 
He wants the vineyard to turn into a vegetable garden so that he can look at it pleasantly because of its proximity to his house. In other words, he has no real need of this man's vineyard. You with me? He doesn't need it. Doesn't need the wine, doesn't need it for food. He just wants it because he wants it. Nabal says, no. As the Lord lives, he will honor his family legacy and Levitical law, which states that you are not to permanently sell your ancestors' inheritance. So Naboth is not negotiating with Ahab. Naboth is not trying to play hardball. He's not trying to drive the price up. Naboth is simply standing on the commandment of the Lord and saying, no, Ahab, I cannot sell you my family's inheritance. Ahab is so greedy, so greedy that just hearing no sends this man home depressed. He goes home and the Bible says he can't eat. Now, I don't know, uh, I don't know enough Greek and Hebrew to know if there's a such thing as a whiny tense, right? <laughs> but in my mind, when I, when I read, you know, Ahab talking to Jezebel, she's like, what's wrong with you? The Bible says his back was turned, right? So this is kind of, this is just for the camera, y'all go like this. <laughs> Ahab, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Nahib ain't gonna sell me, he won't sell me his vineyard. Like, no, matter of fact, that's too manly. This one. He won't sell me his vineyard, yo. Like, I'm sorry, y'all. It's gonna be real spiritual. I get three jokes per message. That's in the contract, all right? Three, all right? The point is, like, he is a king and he's whining because he can't have this man's vineyard, even though he doesn't need this man's vineyard. And this reveals the ideals of the worldly kingdom. I don't know if you know it or not, but the kingdom of the world wants what it wants. It matters not if it's necessary. It matters not if it's excessive. It matters not if it means displacing somebody else. He ready to kick this man out of his family inheritance that has been given by God, land toiled by men, generation after generation after generation, walking in the faithfulness of God. And he wants to displace all of that because he likes the look of vegetables on his porch when he looks up. The kingdom of the world values this comfort, power, Selfish ambition. I don't know if you know it or not. In the world's kingdom, you do really well if you love those things too. I don't know if you know it or not. We're actually discipled towards these things in the world. You know that? There's television shows. There's advertising. There's marketing. There's all kind of centers where they train hundreds of people to offer you these things. More comfort. More selfish ambition. More money, more power. In this little vineyard is an image, a snapshot of the world around us today. Fighting and clawing, upset when a person cannot take what they want when they want to. It's the ideals of the kingdom. What happens next? Ahab does that whiny thing I told you about. He won't sell me his vineyard, right? And then Jezebel, is, <laughs> she's, she's interesting. <laughs> I know y'all are waiting on me to say a whole bunch of stuff. This message ain't about Jezebel, okay? I'm not saying she ain't going to come up, but I'm saying y'all got to stop looking at me so hard is what I'm saying. <laughs> I see some of y'all faces. I ain't heard enough points about Jezebel. I want to hear. Okay, here it is. This is what happens. Bible says this in verse Let's go verse 7. I'll tell you what, we'll go... Yeah. Then his wife Jezebel said then, verse 7. Now exercise your royal power over Israel. Get up, eat some food, and be happy. This is what she tells him. For I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. I don't know if I need to mention this to you, 
uh, but in this scenario, one person is the king and one person ain't. <laughs> Do you notice that it looks like all of the roles are reversed in this thing? The king has his back turned, talking through his shoulder blade. The queen is the one saying, hey, don't worry, eat some food, be happy, it's all right. Like I take care of everything, I'll go ahead and get you the vineyard too. Again, every kingdom has ideals, installation, and impact. So we see what, it, what the ideals of the world's kingdom are. Let's see if we can see the installation. This is what, Je, this is what Jezebel does. She wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. She sent the letters to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth in his city. In the letter, she wrote this, proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the head of the table. Then seat two wicked men opposite him and have them testify against him saying, you have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. This is, this is maybe worse. Verse 11. And the men of the city, the elders and the nobles who lived in the city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them. Just as it was written in the letter, she had them, or she had sent them. They proclaimed the fast. They seated Naboth at the head of the table, head of the people. The two wicked men came in and sat opposite him. Then the wicked man testified against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth have cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. Verse 14, then they sent word to Jezebel. Naboth has been stoned to death. When Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, get on up, baby. Take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, who refused to give it to you for silver, since Naboth isn't alive. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up to go down to the vineyard, and Naboth the Jezreel, of neighbors, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. So this is the installation. This is how the kingdom of the world goes about securing or enforcing its value system. What we see is a plan by, again, not the king. So the king, the rightful king, abdicates his responsibility because he's so distraught that he can't do what he wants. In that abdication, another person steps into the king's place, impersonates him, which means she has no power. See, that's a Jezebel point for you. There you go. She has no power. She impersonates him and then comes up with an elaborate scheme to curse Naboth in front of the people, take him outside, and stone him to death. Now, there's a couple of things here. One, it's impossible to be in this city and not see a blatant disregard for displacement. It's impossible to see the fact that Ahab is all too willing to take something precious from Naboth and only give him what the worldly kingdom values instead of Naboth. This is why he offers him, hey, let me get this and I will give you its gold or its worth in silver. See, in a negotiation, you can tell who values what. He says, no, give me your inheritance and I'll give you silver for it. Meaning he loves what? Silver. Or he says this, if you prefer, if that ain't good enough for you, I'll give you a better vineyard. Now this is interesting. According to our little verbal montage, there is no better vineyard. And the reason there is no better vineyard is because this is the vineyard that the Lord has provided and sustained for generations. So a better one or a bigger one wouldn't be better because it would not have the history and the legacy, the longevity of fellowship with God in tilling the ground. You might not know it in our family, but the kingdom of the world is a kingdom that values the now over everything. 
The world's kingdom does not value legacy. It doesn't value longevity. It values how you feel and what you want right now. This is maybe why in God's kingdom, there is a value of patience. Because patience actually purifies what you want right now. I know, right? It's like, man, whatever you just asked for today, you got to wait. While we hate it, the truth is, Waiting is a sanctifying work of God that translates us from the now fast-paced worldly kingdom to a future and eternal kingdom we have with Christ. Make sense? Back to my three. So the ideals of the world's kingdom, it values comfort, selfish ambition, getting it your way, money, power, success, respect. It installs this or goes about enforcing these values by doing what Jezebel did. Corruption, greed, abuse of power, murder. I wonder if there's anywhere in society where you see any of this. I don't know. I know we got a lot of different people from a lot of different places in this room right now. We got people who are born and raised, been in Detroit all their lives. We got people who just heard about Detroit a couple years ago. All are welcome, by the way, okay? Don't get into an east side, west side debate with them. I, I tried that, that doesn't work. Other than that, welcome. But more than how you feel about the city, the question I would have is, have you identified the kingdom of the world working in around our city or are you just going about life the way you know to do and you don't really notice anything wrong with this? I think there's some people that tell stories about Detroit and it's, it's interesting. Having lived in Detroit for almost five years and there's some things that I found out. We're going to get to some of them. I made a list. I won't show you the whole list. I'll show you a couple. Pastor Sonny told me that would be bad. I wasn't going to do that. The point is the world's kingdom is present already at work in our city and when your phone is pinged by an amber alert of a one-year-old being taken at seven o'clock in the morning guess what that is in fact the world's kingdom at play trying to enforce worldly agendas and worldly principles you understand that so that's how it enforces, it abuses power, it manipulates power, it manipulates influence, and it does so to get its way and to put its values on display. Now, what's the result? When Naboth goes to take possession of the land that Jezebel so fiercely secured for him. He, he gets to this field to take possession and lo and behold, the prophet Elijah shows up. And this is literally what he says. Oh, my enemy, you found me. <laughs> hey, you can't make it up. Like, you know you've done something wrong when the prophet show up and you go, man. <laughs> I thought we was good. I thought we got away. But he literally says to Elisha, he says, oh, my enemy, have you found me, huh? And this is what Elisha the prophet says to Ahab, standing in the field of the man he just advocated with authority and had senselessly murdered. This is what God says. This is the word of the Lord. Or well, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to bring disaster on you and will eradicate your descendants. I will wipe out all of Ahab's males, both slave and free, in Israel. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, uh, and like the house of Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you have angered me and caused Israel to sin. The Lord also speaks of Jezebel. The dogs will eat Jezebel in the plot of land at Jezreel. Anyone who belongs to Ahab dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And anyone who dies in the field, the birds will eat. Now, 
I realize Bible speak doesn't always translate, right? Have you ever heard a story in the Bible and it says after somebody died and they were laid to rest in the land of their fathers? Yeah, when the Bible does that, it speaks of a person dying and being raised or, or left in their place or that plot of land of their family. It's a type of honorable death. When you see dogs eat your bones or dogs eat your bodies, this is, it speaks to a judgment, all right? God judges Ahab and whether you know it or not, he judges the kingdoms of our world. You should know this and, and you probably already know it. I should say it anyway, though. There is not one senseless death or murder that happens that God does not take notice of. I know, I know. You're thinking, well, they got away with it. I'm, I'm, I promise you they haven't. I know. You're thinking, but, but, but they didn't get justice. The case didn't go like we thought it would. No, no, no. I promise you the king sees it. Just like he saw this man senselessly killed Naboth, sent his word there to catch him in the exact moment he thought he was going to get what he wanted. The voice of God shows up and says, hey, guess what? You didn't get away with it. And everything that you've done, guess what? You will pay for it. The lie in our culture today is living according to the world's values will give you a measure of success. It'll make you happy to block everything else out and do what you really want. Just get yourself right and, 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 and do your thing. Ignore everybody else. I saw a video yesterday saying you the prize. <laughs> hey, it was so funny. There's this thing in our culture where we are so starved for glory. We literally encourage each other saying stuff like, hey, you know what? If they don't want to respect you, forget about it. You never talk to them ever again in your life. Do you realize if we lived according to the kingdom of this world, not only would we die alone, <laughs> but you would literally waste your entire life trying to get the very thing that if you ever got your hands on it, it would never satisfy you anyway. It's interesting to hear celebrities and other people who are rich beyond, well, just numbers of money that don't make sense. I don't care who you are. At a hundred million, whether you got 250, 350, 450, I mean, come on, like it's all kind of, you, you're rich, all right? And you hear these people say stuff like, hey, what have you learned after getting all this money? You know what they say? I've learned none of it matters. <gasps> Excuse me? <laughs> 300 mil? <gasps> Doesn't matter. Doesn't mean anything. So why, why, why are there prayer meetings, conferences dedicated to us getting all that money? Oh, you... Oh, you, you thought it was carnal people. <laughs> you thought it was non-church conferences about money. Oh, you don't know there's church conferences about money? You don't know that there are rules of telling people when to take offerings and to take it when the music is playing and people all got that pep in their step? All of this conniving stuff in the world that we live in, it is all set up for us to desire the ideals of the world's kingdom. And if we're not careful, family, we will be in church and still living according to the world's kingdom. Looking at people for what they can do. I want to be close to such and such because if I'm close to them, I know good stuff will happen. I, I'll get in close with Pastor Sonny and, and then people will see, no, I'm, I, I got something. I'm, I'm, I'm like that. I'm him, perhaps. You probably know it already, again, because y'all are smart. You know that the world's kingdom does not lead you to fulfillment or life. It leads you to the very destruction that it has been promised by the king eternal. Meaning, whenever we subscribe to the world's kingdom, guess what? You are not in charge. I wish I learned this when I was younger because I remember growing up in a house that was so church that literally it was 
everything we did. I think I might have got keys to the church the same year I got keys to my house. Like, that's how church I grew up. And even with all of that church and being there all the time, I had this attitude that says, one day I'm going to be in control of my own life. I'm going to be able to make decisions and I'm going to choose what I want to do. I'm going to choose where I go and what I do. I could not wait to be free from the principles that guided my home only to find out that the way I thought I wanted to go actually wasn't my idea. This is the thing about pride. When you have it, you think you're calling your shots. I don't know if you was here any of these past three weeks. You know what Pastor Sonny read that Paul said? It says this, their God is their belly. You know what that means? It means you ain't even in control. You ain't even calling the shots. You have desires. You are driven by something you cannot control or contain. That's why in this story, nobody has power. Can you see it? Why is Ahab at home crying? Why did he lie on Naboth? Naboth never said, I won't give you. He, he said, I can't give you my inheritance of my ancestors. It's a law. Jezebel gets involved. She has no power. She's acting like him, signing his name to the letter and the seal and all of that. Everybody is acting like they're controlled, but no one is in control. There's a moment, I'm sorry. I grew up with older people, you gotta, you gotta bear with me. There's a term called straw boss. I know not everybody knows what it means. This is what it means. Straw boss means you look like you in charge. You look like you got power. I don't know if you've ever seen a scarecrow, right? A scarecrow is inanimate. It is set up in a field so that its position makes you feel as if it will do something. It will neutralize a threat. The truth is it cannot move. When you subscribe to sin, do you know you're like that? You think it's you calling the shots. You think it's you deciding who you cut off. You think it's you deciding who you will go after, what you will do. It's not. Their God is their bellies. We become primal when we just get in the space where we want to get whatever it is we want. I have to, I got to guard my heart against the things I actually can have. There's things I actually can do it. And do you know I still have to pay attention? Why? Because getting too many things your way taints your mind. It poisons your heart when you're so used to everybody serving you. This is the, the world's kingdom at work. That's good. What about heaven's kingdom? How do we see heaven's kingdom? Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Verse 20 says this. Then the mother of Zebedee, or of Zebedee's sons, approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit on your right and on your other, and the other on your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? <laughs> in true disciple fashion, they say, we are able. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> you got to love them. Verse 23, he told them, you will indeed drink my cup. But to sit at my right and my left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two other two brothers. Jesus called them over and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in high places act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom or as a ransom for many. 
gonna be honest with you, we're gonna hang in one verse for all three points because they're all there in one verse. The ideals of the kingdom of heaven clearly are in direct opposition to the world. In the world, the ideas or the value system is set up for control, for money, for success, selfish ambition, having your way. If you want to be with people, you're with people. If you don't want to be around anybody, well, then no one has access to you. And that is okay in the world's kingdom. But in heaven's kingdom, according to Jesus, not power, not control, not being served. According to Jesus, what heaven looks at and smiles at and goes, yeah, that's it. It's when you humble yourself and prefer somebody else instead of you. Can you see how diabolical this is? This means the worldly kingdom didn't just distort a good thing. It means it is literally set up to get you to do the very opposite of the thing that God wants you to do. No, 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 that's not good enough. The opposite of the thing that God made you to do. If you were made by a creator whose value or who values service above being served, then it means no matter how gifted you are, no matter how good you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how successful you are, he did not make you to be served. He made you to serve everybody else. Maybe this is a fundamental reorientation. Like maybe this should change some of our, just our, our self perspective. Because if you believe you're made to be served, then guess when you are most upset with your life? When you're not being served. Well, I don't have stuff, God. You didn't make me to not have stuff, God. You made stuff, you made me. I should have stuff. I mean, somebody gotta have stuff. <laughs> A lot of houses in the city, somebody should have one, right? Like, like you made me, you made that, I like that, you know that, I should get stuff. And imagine you saying that to a loving God and him looking at you with love in his eyes and saying, I never made you for people to serve you and pour stuff on you. I made you to serve everybody I made you so that you would not find your way atop the population but beneath it the values of the kingdom of heaven are totally different than the world's kingdom so much so they annoy people in the world they irritate they frustrate you get marked if you value the kingdom in a worldly kingdom's context they hate you no, like hate you, not not like you. They hate you. They see you coming and they start talking. They, why? Because everything about the kingdom you subscribe to is set up and more powerful, might I add, than everything they subscribe to. Now, how does it, how does the kingdom of heaven enforce or install its ideas? This is beautiful. Do you realize Jesus installs the kingdom of heaven with his very own blood and his very own body? Check this out. We just read a story about Naboth, a man trying to honor his father, trying to honor God, ran up against corrupt leadership. The corrupt leaders lie on him. the head of the table they put two people on both sides of them they have him executed illegitimately oh I don't know what does that sound like to you I think I, I remember another figure in the Bible who was trying to honor his father who was perfect sinless no no error found in him right he obeyed what the father said but some corrupt leaders who thought they had power didn't really have it they made a cockamamie scheme made a kangaroo court had him put not the head of a table but the head of a cross put two scoundrels on both sides 
He put two thieves on both sides of Jesus and they had him executed illegitimately. Because in their mind, they're going to be able to take possession of what he has after he's gone. The difference is with this victim of corruption, of abuse of power, unlike Naboth, Jesus, three days later, steps out of the tomb. Now, this is huge. This means Jesus is the greater Naboth. This means in his kingdom, he identifies with those that are victims, those who are defenseless. He empowers the weak people by his very own reversing places with them. This is the reason why as you come into his kingdom, you are not the same weakling to sin you have been all your life. Because the Bible says he came not to be served, but to serve, giving his life, what? A ransom for a minute. Well, then what does that mean? Here, this is what John, 1 John 5, it says this. Man, if this ever just went as quick as I was, that would be, amen. 1 John 5, verse 4 says this. Because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. I'm going to read it again. Everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world. Our faith. Who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is in fact the son of God. Do you realize when he ransomed you, he translated you into his kingdom and now he has empowered you with himself. So what you used to have that was weak, that was a slave to sin, he's taken that mortal body, revived your spirit, made you alive in him, and now, believe it or not, you can resist the world's kingdom. It is totally possible for a believer in Jesus who has faith in the finished work of the cross to abstain from sin. I know, I know you think everybody is just the worst ever in the church and out of the church because we're all human beings. Guess what? No, there's a such thing as a dead spirit and a revived spirit. And once Jesus revives your dead spirit, converts your soul, he can through his per perfect sacrifice on the cross and his spirit that indwells you he can enable you to overpower the world's kingdom in your life and around you somebody should be really really happy Destination that whatever it is you fell victim to before you met Jesus, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was sexual immorality, maybe it was greed, maybe it was just a horrible self image. You just think you are worse than everybody else he made. Whatever it is, the ones that are born of God have conquered the world. The heavenly kingdom enables us to overpower the world's kingdom. Do you know that? It is available. Like earthly, worldly, kingdom conquering power is not just possible. It's what you were made to carry. It's how he thinks about you. Like God does not think about you as, as weak or as some slave to your belly or some crazy thing. No, he thinks about you as his son or his daughter that he has empowered to overpower the obstacles, the impediments of the world's kingdom all throughout our culture. What's the impact? Well, the impact should be if you are a part of the kingdom of heaven, you now are not driven away from control and power and success or driven towards it. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, excuse me, uh, Fonz. I try my best to avoid prideful scenarios. There's a lie that persists that some people manipulate that says, if you love God, you should be poor. And the reason why poor is better, because you have less temptation. There's less of an opportunity for you to become prideful. And believe it or not, some of you have gifts, should be serving, 
but you don't because you're afraid if you serve too well, it would give an opportunity for your pride to be stirred up and people will be looking at you and that would make you uncomfortable. So for some of you, you are driven far away from serving because you're driven away from the magnetism of control, power, and self-ambition. Ask me how I know. <laughs> I was born and raised into it, literally. My grandfather used to say phrases like, wait, 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 can't say that, because that didn't mean you think you all that. There's a term older people used to use. I don't know if people still use it. It was, you smelling yourself. And, and every so often, I would hear that. Like, going, hey, 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 now, all right, Fonz, you, you're smelling yourself. Now, slow down. I would say, well, well, I wrote this thing, or I made this thing, or listen to this, you know. As kids, you know, I think Jazz knows. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Sunny, too. When you're a kid and you make something, you want to show your parents, right? So imagine when you start making music, right? You play your whole albums. Like I used to come in with the keyboard and play it for my mom. Like, no, hear the bridge. Like, listen to every part of it. I want you to hear all of what I made. And in a similar sense, this is a part of our here and our now. Like, God has given us gifts, not for you, but for the body. And if you get so disheartened because you got to fight harder to not be prideful, that you give up the work of serving, then the, the result of that is we have the absence of your gift, the absence of your service, and we are all less for it. <laughs> like, do you realize if, if, if you are one of those people like me, <laughs> and again, I, I cannot, I, 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 you know, I've been trying to find it. I've been going through my life with a pair of scissors and a flashlight trying to cut it out, trying to figure out where it started and how, why I'm so uncomfortable with people. If you ever given me a compliment, you would know. The first thing I was like, whoa, whoa, no, no, not me, no, mm -mm, right? I trip trying not to take a compliment. I'm one of those people, it's horrible. I'm being honest with y'all. Now, if you pay me compliments after this to, to make me suffer, that'd be bad. Don't do that. <laughs> take the message out of context, don't do that, okay? The point is, for some people, they are driven away from it. Other people are driven to it and they can't understand why. Some people, it ain't just that they have ambition. They have selfish ambition and they cannot discern the difference. And this is important. How do we tell the difference between selfish ambition and holy ambition? Ambition in itself is morally, morally neutral. You know what ambition means? It just means a strong desire to do something. That's it. So it could be a God thing. It could be a you thing. How do you tell the difference? I'll help you out. I'll use me. I'm on the, I'm on the carpet. I'm on the rug. It's fine. We, were, we had a service opportunity years ago. He, hopefully you don't remember. Uh, and we went to feed the hungry. That's a good thing, right? That's good. Feeding the hungry. Everybody should feed the hungry. I was excited. I went, fed the hungry, and, and we went. Sonny was out there with other people on the table passing out food. I'm in the truck. I'm, I'm on pallet ministry. And I ain't saying nothing out loud, right? But in my head, I'm like, ain't this, this ain't what I signed up for. I wanted to feed the hungry. Well, I'm in the truck. <laughs> I ain't gonna tell you who all was there. That would mess the story. The point is, I looked around and everybody else was over there, and I'm in the truck, and I was feeling kind of a way about it. And it's as if God knew that, and He allowed a box to hit me upside the head. <laughs> it's not hard. Didn't leave a bruise, just enough to get my attention, right? And God literally asked me. He said, "What was the goal here? What was the goal? What well, to feed the hungry?" He said, "Look over there. They're being fed." I said, "Yeah, but." He said, aha, so your ambition wasn't to feed the hungry. Your ambition was that you would be fed by feeding the hungry. Had a whole situation with God in that truck. Now, later on, I got to come out the truck, got to help him, got to pass food out. It was a great time. But what I learned in that moment is that you can be selfishly ambitious and have no idea about it. And here is the telltale sign. If you really believe something should happen and that people should be served, then you are elated when that people is served, whether it has something to do with you or not. I don't do this all the time. But I'm gonna take a couple minutes and do this now. Now I don't throw weight around at Detroit Church. I just I'm, I just serve here. I help. But I've been around before Detroit Church was a thing. I went to the church when the church didn't have a name. I know that don't mean something, y'all. We was kind of worried about that. The point is, 
I've been here for a very long time. Can I tell you something? And this is not boast. This is humility. We have not one time in eight and a half years had a fight for power at the top of the church. There has never been competition between Pastor Sonny and me, Pastor Sonny, or anybody else. We've never had uh, uh, little factions where this person has this group and this person has that group. For our eight and a half years, we have been sacredly fastened to the fact that God, first off, called Sonny to lead the church as a senior pastor and that we would do it with a shared leadership model. And that ain't changed in over eight and a half years. But I need to be clear because... This is just a real thing. We're all humans. We're all fallible. The truth is, selfish ambition can creep up in any one of us. Not you, us. It could creep up in any one of us. And if you are here because you feel like you have identified some missing spot, some loophole, some one thing that if we just had you, our church would be the church God intended for it to be, you might be selfishly ambitious. If you believe you are the one that will add the thing that is missing, that somehow he needed you to skip over everybody else that's here. I sit in some of these meetings and I hear people tell me how they were called to Detroit. Nothing wrong with that. I was called to Detroit too. I'm from Pontiac. <laughs> I mean, me, me too. He, he calls us from near and far, I guess. <laughs> you from the other half of the globe, me from Pontiac 30 minutes away. Who knew? I love it. Call to Detroit. That's great. When I hear people mention how they're called to Detroit, I think about my arrival in Detroit. My arrival in Detroit was like this. For the first three weeks I lived here, I pretty much got cussed out at every food restaurant around my house. Seriously, it was so bad. At one point, Cam was like, can I go with you? I just want to see what's happening. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's the smiling face, if I look like I'm from Pontiac. I don't know. I don't know if people just don't like Pontiac people. I don't understand what it was. Kept happening to me. But you know what it taught me? This city does not care one bit about me being called to it. Not only that, but it reveals more about me than the city if my coming here was to be served while serving the city. This is the difference between selfish ambition and heavenly ambition. Selfish ambition, oh, you will serve. You will be great. You will also be crazy. I should mention that too. Selfish ambition will have you stepping outside of your competency, outside of your capacity, and outside of your relational fortitude. What that means is you want to do something you don't know how to do, you want to do something you ain't got time to do, or you want to do something that will require somebody who is known here and not a stranger. Heavenly ambition is this. I just want God's people to be served. I don't care what it means for me. Matter of fact, if it makes me uncomfortable, I'm fine. If it hurts, if it costs me something, I'm fine. As long as the people are served. I'm going to be honest with you. If you're here and you're thinking this is the place where you're going to just set up shop. Can I be honest with you? Like, this is just the real thing. You don't have leaders here that just abandon leadership roles and leave it to be caught by anybody who wants a job. Your pastors are not pastors that just go, well, we don't want to deal with it, so here you go. Anybody that wants to take it, you take it. And not, not, I'm not saying that because we haven't made that mistake in the past. I'm saying right now, we, again, as a church and community, are convinced that what we're doing is sacred and we have to protect it. And we need you to help us protect it. We need you to work with us in protecting it. And that means checking any inkling of selfish ambition in your own heart. And it is excruciating. 
I got to do it every single day. There's not one day where I go, hey, you know what? Today I wasn't selfish. There's not one day. Every day. My wife says something. Wait, what? Who are you talking to? Right? Like, my kid says something. Wait, who? Wait, what? <laughs> Any day, every day, there's something that happens. And my first thought is, what does that mean for me? What does that mean to me? Then I got to have devotion time. Then I got to go back to all them people and go, hey, baby, I'm sorry. You know, I was, uh, <laughs> I took that as a personal thing. My bad. I was, I was being sensitive. That's my bad. Davis, come here. Yeah, you come on over. Daddy messed that one up, right? Like, then I got to go back. Why? Because I have to keep checking selfish ambition in my heart. Because I'm not a part of the kingdom of the world. I'm not a part of just doing what I want to do and making everybody else move to, to the beat of my drum. In the kingdom, what's valued is our humble service. Being like our king who didn't come to be served. Didn't come to make a name for himself. It doesn't mean you won't be served. It doesn't mean you won't get stuff. It doesn't mean nothing good will ever happen. It just means that's not your primary intent. What kind of community would we have if we had a church full of people that took every single gift that they had and not found the highest place but the lowest place? What church will we have if everybody here said, you know what? I'm going to try to get as low as I possibly can and try to elevate my community by way of humble service. What would our city look like if there was a church with incinerated selfish ambition? There was a church where God had purged us. He had burned away all of the selfishness and what we want to do. And the only thing left was God's agenda and what he wants to do and how we can serve it eternally. Make sense? As we've done, we have our pledge and, and we, need to, we need to end with this. And again, Pastor Sonny, you got, you got, he says you can read it. I just wanted to just go right in, hot. But he said we need to take a second, read it. Make sure you agree. I'll be honest with you. I wrote it and failed at it the same day I wrote it. Because every part of our culture is set up to serve and to make us comfortable. Like, let's be honest. Some of y'all are great cooks. You will eat worse food and pay money for it. Why? Because the difference is one you're serving and the other you're being served. For me, I can't cook, so it's fine. But for y'all, it's a real thing. <laughs> I walked in that one. Okay, that makes sense. So, we all ready? We had a moment. This is what I say before we say this. Please don't think that this is like a thing you need to say for us here. Like, don't think that if it's social pressure to repeat what everybody else said. This is a real thing, and this means you will pay a cost for it if you mean this. Can I be honest with you? A long time ago, I had to resolve that when the story of Detroit Church is told long after I'm gone, guess what? I got to be cool with the fact that my name may not be mentioned at all. And that's fine. Okay? Here it is. I pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God and to the cross for which it stands. I will stand against the temptation to be served and or comfortable. I commit to serving God and others, even at the risk of my power, my leisure, and my ambition. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. We pray, Father, that you would sanctify our hearts. You go deep within us. You see what we don't. You know the things that nag us and annoy us. You know where we've made this life all about us. You know where we desire to be served and comfortable above following your mission and serving others. Would you do the work of changing our hearts and our minds and our lives as a result? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.